Yeah. We've got a very special guest today. Uh, welcome to the Incredible Javier Show on Icon Radio. Today we're talking with Keith the Boss Class. Thank you for uh, joining us today, man. Hey, pleasure to be here, man. So, you know, I, I think you have a, a, a very unique story, um, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to chop it up with us. So if it's okay with you, I just wanted to see if we can get started from the beginning. How, how was life for you growing up? Well, I'm, I'm originally from Hartford, Connecticut. I'm a project baby, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we moved to California when I was five years old, moved to okay. L.A., you know, over on the west side. And uh, life was, it was a trip because when I first moved here, well, moved to L.A., I'm in Texas now, but when I first moved to L.A., I had to adjust to the smog. You know, so I can only oh, go yeah. outside and play for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And then my nose would start burning. My lungs would start burning. I had to, I could, I didn't know what was going on. So I had to run back in the house for a couple hours and then come back outside and play again until, you know, my body got used to it. But man, growing up in LA was a lot of fun. You know, it was also challenging at times because you had to deal with neighborhood bullies, depending on where, you know, what part of the city you were living in, you know. Uh, I moved to Baldwin Park when I was in fifth grade. I got kicked because I got kicked out of LA Unified. Okay. You know, so we moved out to Baldwin Park. Then uh, I ended up getting kicked out of Baldwin Park Unified School District. Went to Juvenile Hall, you know, for a minute. Leroy Boys Home up in Laverne. Oh, I man. came home. That was sixth grade. That is sixth grade. I came home right before uh, the start of ninth grade in high school. Damn. So you did about three years in, in that program? Yeah. Yeah. How, how was that Just for you? Just under two years. Or how, was, how was that for you being so young, having being separated from your family and, and having to to go through, you know, that, that kind of a situation? It was, man, it was crazy. My mom's first visit, you know, to come see me at LP, I was in a box for fighting. Yeah. Got, you know, got down with this fool from Compton. And, uh, you know, he came in my room, fired on me. And, you know, I, I let it, you know, I gave him a pass the first few times. I, I was just sitting there, you know, reading, minding my business. Yeah. And, uh, well, Keith? The next time he came in and did it, no, yeah. you know, oh, I, I got up and I, I just, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Phone cut out there a little bit. So you said that you were just there reading? Yeah, I was I was just sitting there reading, and uh, my boy came in there and fired on me again, and walked away laughing. Mm -hmm. I got up, man, it just took off on him. I took flight, you know. Yeah. I had to, cause you know how it is, man. Yeah. You know, they'll they'll prey on you if they think that you're weak, and uh, we ended up in the box, and that's you know that's how my first patient with moms came about. Damn. You know, she had to come see me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what what did what did she say when when she comes to see you and you're not like with the other wards like like you're you're are not in the wards and minors back then you're at the other minors, and they uh um, you know they basically got you in another section. What, what did she say? She asked me what happened, you know, and I ran it down to her, and uh she said, hey, well you got to you got to defend yourself. Yeah. You know, you got you got cats from all over in there from different neighborhoods and you're gonna run across rivals, you know, all the time. You know, the, the street beef don't stop just because you're behind the wall. Sometimes it intensifies, especially when you're younger. Yeah. Everybody's trying to build a reputation, you know. And, and uh were you banging at that point? Yeah, yeah. I'm from Nine Deuce Hoover. So, so so Hoover's a, a large, large neighborhood and you guys have a lot of like enemies, right? So how, how was it having to like be in, or, or did you run into a lot of enemies in there? Man, everybody was an enemy. We didn't, we didn't get along with anybody. So, yeah. you know, everybody was an enemy except for the Long Beach cats. We were, you know, we were cool with them. Yeah. So, and, and you said- gangsters, we were cool with them. Okay, okay. But I know like with the eight sevens and a lot of other hoods, like, like you guys were beefing with, with them. So that's it's pretty crazy because you know, uh, uh, so you you get in there and uh, um, you have to handle your business. Uh, you end up going to that that boys that boys home. You stay there. You said for about a little under two years. Yeah, yeah. So I was a, yeah. 
And uh, you know, same same thing up at the boys' home, man. You know, because fools are still trying to establish establish reputation. And uh, uh, at any point were you just tripping out, like like, or, or was it all? Were you like wanting to? Because you you had, or did, let me ask, did you have dreams to do anything more, or were you just at that point where you just stuck in like this is? Oh, what absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I always wanted, to, you know, since I was a kid, I always wanted to play in the NBA. You know, I just didn't know that I eventually hit seven three. Yeah, but that was always a you know a childhood dream of mine. And uh, wh- while you're gang banging and you're getting down with everybody, do you have a chance? Are you, uh, or I should ask, did they give you a chance to to play ball? Yeah, yeah. You know, while I was in that. While I, was, while I was in that group home, you know, they had a great sports program. Um, our basketball team went like 36 and two. Damn. You know, and yeah, yeah. We we're playing against AAU programs, playing against the camps, you know, we we're just whooping on everybody. But uh, it was a lot of fun, you know. Uh, basketball basically saved my life, though, because it got me away from all the you know, all the, all the crazy shit that was going on in the hood. Yeah, that's dope. Uh, let, let me ask, uh, uh, when you're in the boys' home and you're in that basketball team, well, was there at any point where you were, like, teamed up with rivals? Oh, yeah, yeah. My roommate played, and he was he was from Bloodstone Villain. Oh, shit. You know, had a, yeah, had another dude who was, a you know, a couple of Pyrus on the team, a couple guys from East Coast, you know. Um, another dude from a uh, five, well, back then they're five, seven hustle crib, but now they're neighborhoods. But, uh, yeah, oh, most definitely. Uh, how, how did that feel being young, but, uh, knowing that you had this dream and knowing that this team was going to help you like move further into that direction, how did it feel to kind of push aside those beefs and make those people part of your team where you had to rely on them day in, day out? We love basketball, so yeah. you know that that was the common bond right there for us. You know, our, our love for the game, and while we were between those lines, everything was cool. But once we got off the court, you know, the same bullshit came back again. <laughs> that's that's crazy, man. Because that, <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's it's a, it's a trippy situation because uh, uh, while you're there, like you guys got each other's back, right? Like like while you're on right, the court, right. if somebody fouls them hard, I'm pretty sure you guys are gonna try to get that run back. You guys are gonna try to do what you gotta do because that's your teammate, and they're gonna break your team. But once you're off, right. it's like that team that, like that camaraderie going away, that's kind of crazy because you don't hear a lot yeah, of that yeah, too yeah. much. Right, that, and it's a trip. But now, you know, I still stay in touch with a lot of those guys. You know, to this day. Dope. And uh, you know, everybody's lives are, everybody's in a different place. Yeah. You know, as far as maturity and how they're living their lives today, and uh, it's crazy how we we always sit back and reminisce about you know those days and how crazy it was for us and just seeing our personal growth and where we're at today as men as fathers you know some of us are married you know and um it's a beautiful thing oh yeah and and did you uh was that when you got out from the boys home was that your last time uh, being incarcerated uh as a juvenile juvenile, yeah as a juvenile yeah after that the only time i got locked up was you know county time for three DUIs that I had driving on a suspended license, stupid shit like that. Nothing major. So, um, when you got out, um, what, did they send you back home or did you, uh, or did they send you somewhere else? Or how did that work? They sent me home, you know, they sent me home and, uh, I had gotten kicked out of that district already. So I had to go to another school, you know, and, uh, for my freshman year of high school. And, uh, the school district where we live, they eventually overturned the decision and allowed me to come back. Okay. My sophomore year. I was trying to get back to LA to go to high school, but mom wasn't having it because she caught wind of my activities. You yeah. know, I, was, I did my best to hide it from her, but you know, parents, man. Oh yeah, they know. They know, they know. Yeah, they know what's up. So she kept me up out of LA to the best of her ability, you know, but late at night, I'm creeping on the bus right back down you know, doing what I got to do, chilling with the homies and then creeping back home, sneaking in, going to sleep, getting ready for school the next day. How, how was it juggling that? 
you know what? Um, it's funny because a lot of my friends didn't know. All they knew was that I was playing basketball. Yeah. You know, that I like pranking people and shit. <laughs> they, had, they, had, they had no idea about the other shit until a few years later, you know, where I, I was, my attitude was just like, fuck it. You know, I, I ain't got nothing to hide. Let them see, you know, what time it really is. Yeah. You know, so some people, it was, it was an adjustment for them. And then yeah. for others, they were just, I was still the same, you know, same key, you know. And uh, um, well, at what point did you get like really dedicated to playing ball? How, how old were you? Uh, my junior year of high school. So what was it? 16, what was it? That, the change that made you want to like say like I think I could do this. Was it just like a growth spur, or was there something in your game that you saw? My my uh, high school coach did let me uh, try out for the team mm. my junior year, and so you know that that anger. Towards him, that resentment, you know, I just got on the AAU scene and just, you know, made my name that way, killing oh. people. So. Why, why didn't he, what, what was the issue with him? Like, why didn't he want to let you on? It's a trip, man. I don't know. We, me and my boy walked into the gym, ready for the tryouts. And he, he stopped us at the door and said, hey, I got enough talent. I don't need you. Damn. You know, you can leave. They lost every game that year. They went on 24. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, a lot of us were at the games heckling, you know, heckling <laughs> the coach, heckling the team. We draw signs and shit, draw pictures of the coach and, and hold them up, home games, away games, just clowning them. That sounds like a bad coach, though, because it's like I, I've never heard, like, even if you go to, like, an NBA draft, I never heard a team say, nah, we got enough talent. Like, hell no, they're going right. to they're gonna try to get it. Especially, <laughs> like, they're going to get the best player they could get. Like, that doesn't make any yeah, sense. man. It didn't make any sense at all. And, you know, he got fired after that year, too. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Well, well, hopefully if these worked out for him and he found something that he was more equipped to do. So, uh, well, fucking, uh, uh, did you end up playing in your, your senior year? Yeah, I played my senior year. I averaged 18 and a half points, 16 and a half rebounds, and like 11 blocks a game. So, so what, what made, I think what, what put you at a disadvantage there is that you, you have great – uh senior numbers right but uh um right. you didn't have a junior year that they can look back on so that uh did that did that hurt you when it came to like scouts looking looking at you no nah, because in aau they oh, were at yeah. all the games yeah all right all right so there, there was always somebody up in the stands you know by the time you were in your senior year did you did you uh already commit anywhere did you know where you're gonna go or did you have an idea i didn't have any clue i didn't sign until right before uh, high school graduation. And, Hold uh, on one second. No problem. Give me one second. All right. <laughs> Five-year-old nephew's beefing with his 13-year-old sister. So. <laughs> that kid's are nuts. Yeah, they are, especially this one. Man. <laughs> so, so uh, he'll, probably uh, come up and he'll probably come up and smack me, you know, on some <laughs> random shit. <laughs> uh, how did you make the decision to uh, to what school you're gonna go to? I was recruited by a lot of schools across the country, but mm -hmm. what happened was because of the situation with my junior year with the coach yeah. turning me away, I was as far as my education was concerned. Yeah. I said, you know, I said, fuck it. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll go to class, but I ain't going to turn in any assignments. I'll do the test, but that's it, yeah. you know. And uh, so that's what I did, you know. But because I scored so well on my test, they still gave me passing grades. Yeah. But uh, I had to, a lot of schools started to drop out of the race because they didn't think I would be eligible because yeah. of the low grades that I got my junior year. So. Basically, what I had to do my senior year was make up all those credits at the same time. Damn. So I went, yeah. So I went to a, um, I went to an adult school, went to Bowen Park Adult School, right next to my high school. You know, after school, you know, until ten o'clock at night. So I was at school from seven in the morning 
to 10 o'clock at night, Monday through Friday, and then a couple hours on Saturdays, you know, just getting those credits back and yeah. getting my uh, college eligibility. Oh, so you really, you really like, like grinded that grind. shit out. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was a grind. And, and let me, uh, go ahead. The coaches from, you know, the coaches from Central Connecticut State University, they, you know, they stayed on top of me because they really believed in me. And uh, so they pushed me, you know, to, and just encouraged me to keep going and stay on track with things. And so I didn't even walk the stage. I graduated, you know, that summer. School was out in June and I, I graduated in July. All right, so, all right. You know, yeah, I got all that eligibility shit taken care of and, you know, was out. And let me rewind a little bit, because, uh, you know, I know you said you, you were in Ball Park. How was that for you growing up, like being from Hoover, growing up in Ball Park? Because I know that the closest Crips are, uh, well, you have West Coast, no, uh, West Coast yep. neighborhood and West Coast mob, Pyro. Right. Uh, but like, there's really aren't any established, like, uh, like we'd say traditional black neighborhoods in Ball Park. Uh, was that an issue None. for you, being that you were banging, or was it a, uh, or did they show you love? No, nah, it wasn't an issue at all. You know, because I grew up on the east side. Okay. You know, and um, I knew I knew all those fools damn near. So dope, it was dope. all love. Yeah. So so you're able to uh, uh get into college and you grind that shit out. Uh, how how do you feel your first day like stepping? Like I know you said you're 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 originally uh not from California, but like you're leaving California again and you're going to to Connecticut. How how does that feel for you? Like getting out, getting back out that way. It was cool, man, because it's all family out there. You know, yeah. my mom's family, my dad's family, that that's home base for me. That's ground zero. So it was straight. You know, I got all my cousins, my grandparents right there. You know, everybody that I hadn't been around, you know, for a lot of years, they're right there. You know, my dad, crazy story. I signed, my dad was in prison. So uh, I signed my national letter of intent at the prison oh, in, the, in the visitation in the visitation room you know i had the news crews there and everything they made a big deal out of it because i wanted my dad to be a part of it oh. you know what i'm saying yeah so the guards showed love and um they let it you know they made sure that they went down that it was a smooth transition you know well what did your what did your dad feel like when, when you did that for him man he was happy as hell he, he cried a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I yeah. would have feel like, man, that's your son like that, man. That's, that's a proud-ass moment right there. Yeah, because I had to make sure he was involved in it. You know, I'm junior. You yeah. know what I mean? So, you know, he wasn't around much because we're on the opposite coast, but that love was still there. You oh, know, yeah. that father-son love was always there. So you... You uh, get to college now. Is, is that that an adjustment from from high school? Um, <laughs> oh man, first week of college, man. The first big party of the school year, man. I get drunk before I even get to the party because I don't know how much drink they're gonna have there. Yeah. You know, and uh, and I'm thinking to myself, whatever they got, I'm gonna just drink all that shit up anyway. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'm already drunk. Show up get into a drinking contest with one of the football players. He passes out right on the spot. We roll <laughs> his big ass under the table. You know, and I'm getting all the high fives and shit, you know, that welcome to college life shit. And I experienced my first blackout ever. Oh, shit. I come to in a hospital bed, handcuffed to the rail. Damn. With a cop standing, with a cop standing guard over me. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm still faded, yeah. you know, and uh, I'm tripping off of it, like, what's going on? And I passed out again. The next time I come to, a couple hours later, man, they give me a, a bag of, you know, my clothes, a plastic bag. My clothes are all wet. I'm tripping off while my clothes are wet. <laughs> I don't know what's going on, you know. Yeah. They handcuff me from the bed, handcuff me, leave me outside. And then I see, okay, it's raining. So whatever happened, I must have been out of the rain. Yeah. But explain the wet clothes. Man, I get to court a couple hours later. One of the court reporters is a 
classmate. And she oh, shit. Smiled and she smiles to me. What happened? And all I could do was whisper back, I don't know. <laughs> and so they called us up. And, uh, a little white dude standing, you know, opposite of me. And he said that uh, he, you know, he's got the double doors for his front door. Yeah. And during the winter time, when it gets real windy, he has a nail that's shut. And he thought that the wind blew his door open. He said he came downstairs. He saw me bent over looking out the window like I was hiding from somebody. I'm sitting there looking at him like, damn, that's a trip. You know, I'm still faded, but I'm tripping off what he's saying because I'm, I'm trying to figure out how in the hell did I get in this position? You know, yeah. <laughs> he says, your honor, I'm thinking this kid is, you know, trying to rob me. And so I run in my kitchen. And I grab the biggest knife I can find. I look at him like, what? And he continues, he says, uh, I crept up behind him. I was going to stab him in his back. And I, I said, you're about to stab me. <laughs> and the judge had to gavel order, sign us, Mr. Claus. And so he says, yeah, I was about to stab you. And he looks up at me. He says, then, Your Honor, he stands up to his full height. I got, I dropped the knife and ran and called 911. He said, I get on the phone with the police. The kid sits down on my couch and says, all I want are my things. All I want are my things? Yeah, all I want are my things. I borrowed my, my homegirl's headphones and uh and I had an umbrella. Yeah. I forgot them at the I forgot them at the house party. But I ended up going to the wrong house. Oh, shit. Trying to go back, trying to go back and get the stuff. And that's what happened. So, you know, I had to pay restitution for the door. Uh, well, one of my uncles paid it because as a college athlete on scholarship. We don't have no money. We can't work. Yeah, you know. So a relative paid that off for me. My coach suspended me from the team. Oh, you know, for a few weeks. I'm up every morning at five in the morning, running in the. Now it's a fucking blizzard. Oh, I'm running sick. every morning before class. You know, running behind an assistant coach and his little uh, geo through the city. Oh, man, it was a, man. Oh, bad. So, but and what's uh, so let, let me ask because I know you're originally from there, but you you've been in California for for years now. How is it adjusting to running in a blizzard? Like I know, like yo, man. I remember being out there as a kid, walking to school and that shit. You know, preschool, kindergarten, frostbite. Oh, yeah, <laughs> frostbite. Yeah, that's the worst thing ever, man. And I hated it then, and I still hate it to this day. Like, I, I refuse to go back during the winter time. I had to recently, you know, a few years ago after my pops passed in December. It's you know, it's another blizzard out there. I was miserable. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 you you like sucked all that up, and you said, "Fuck it, you're gonna do it anyways," because you you have a, a goal in mind. So uh, yeah, absolutely. For the people and then that I got these coaches, and then yeah. I got these coaches that that believe in me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I had one coach like that prior, one of my AAU coaches, Jim Espinosa, who was a retired sheriff's deputy. Yeah. You know, he was, he was the first first person to really have that. Oh, he was the second. The first person to really have that and still that kind of confidence in me was my coach at the group home, Andre Basu, then in high school, AAU. Jim Espinosa, the retired sheriff's deputy, and my college coaches. You know, so those three coaches right there were my biggest, you know, supporters coming up. Dope, dope. And when, uh, so let me just uh, ask for the people who, who, who say, like, it's too hard to, like, reach their goals. When you have to wake up at 5 in the morning every day and, and uh, run sometimes during blizzards, what is it that, that keeps you motivated? Is it just thinking about those people that, that were behind you? Or is there, is there also other factors that, that come into that motivation when it's like you don't really want to do it, but you got to do it? First of all, I fucked up. So, you know, I got it. These are the consequences of my actions. And then secondly, you know, I'm trying to earn my way back on the team so that I can stay you know, moving in the same direction as that goal of becoming a professional basketball player. Because oh, yeah. if I don't follow through with my coach's instructions, 
then I'm not getting back on the team. I can kiss my dreams goodbye. Damn. You know, so that hunger of wanting to make it, you know, and approve the naysayers wrong. You know, the people that said, oh, you'll never make it. You know, all that shit right there drove me. You know what I oh, mean? Yeah. So failure wasn't an option for me. I love that. I love that. And uh, so you, when you eventually make your way back onto the team, how's your first uh, first year stats looking like? Or what are they looking like? Average 10 and a half points, seven rebounds. And I led the nation in shot blocking at like 5.2 or five, no, um, maybe five and a half, almost five and a half blocks a game. Because I broke yeah. Sean Bradley's, you know, freshman record for shot blocking. And uh, yeah. How, how did that feel? the nation in shot blocking. To be that a freshman cool. and, yeah, yeah, and, and have, have something like that happen. That was cool because I started the year as a six man before uh, the coach eventually moved me into the starting rotation. So it was, it was real cool, man, to be able to do that. You know, my team, because of my defense, our, our team led the nation in shot blocking. Damn. And uh, uh, I know deep, like, uh, shot blocking is, is defense. It's all, that's all defense, right? It's not like you're looking yeah. for to block a shot. You're defending, and, and, and they, they put some something up at the wrong time. You're just like, bang, get that shit out of here. So uh, right. were you looking for it, or, or did you just kind of let it come to you? It was a, it was an instinctual thing, you know, because uh, I didn't like being scored on, and I wasn't gonna let my teammates get scored on. Yeah, you know, and uh, our our coach preached defense to us. You know, the best way to score is to play great defense. We limit their opportunities and increase our own. Yeah. So that was the mindset of the whole team. You know. Dope, dope. And, and how long did you uh, uh, how how many years did you attend college? Two years, and I led, I led the nation in shot blocking again my sophomore year. Averaged um yeah like six and a half blocks a game my sophomore year, which broke a season average record. Damn, you know, so that's another record that I got, and um and then it for the career average, I got the the record for that too, you know. Um, and the reason why I left school after my sophomore year is because our our coach got screwed. You know, out of his job, and uh, the incoming coach was, you know, he was an assistant at UConn from a very successful program. Yeah, you know, he was an, an alumni of our school, played there in the '60s. So he had a lot. His best friend from college, his college teammate, best man at his wedding was our athletic director. So it was a perfect opportunity for him to come back. Yeah, you know, and. Uh, he flew my, he had my family, well, my mother fly in from California, called a meeting with my family. So my mom, my grandparents, uncles and aunts, and he's telling them and telling me that uh, he's going to keep one or two of our assistant coaches to, to make the transition easier for us players. And, that, you know, I want to make sure that your son goes to the NBA under my, under my tutelage. I'm going to do everything I can for him. Yeah. You know, man, the day after the meeting, he fired all the coaches, all of the remaining coaches. Damn. So right there, let me know I couldn't trust them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Plus, you lied to my family. You lied to my mom. You lied to my grandma, my grandpa. I can't fuck with you. you yeah, know? you know, that's, that's kind of so, weird, too, because it's like, why even call the meeting if he was going to do that? It's like, it's unnecessary. He's the coach. He's going to do whatever he wants to do anyway. So why even right. why even get up, the players involved like like that? They, I I probably would do the same thing. Like I don't know about this guy. I said, I mean, that's right. what I him. So I was going to transfer to Utah yeah. um, with my boy Andre Miller because I was initially supposed to go to Utah with him, and because uh, we were AAU teammates, we were real tight back then. But uh, this my my school fucked up my transcripts so that I would be ineligible. And couldn't transfer anywhere. Oh shit! And so I just yeah. So I just came back to Cali, you know, for for about six months, and then an agent connected me with a uh, with a trainer in Norwalk, Norwich, Connecticut. Sam Romanella, former boxer, you know, who started training me, and um, I lived with him and his family. Beautiful people lived with them for a few months. 
just training and preparing for the NBA combines and everything. So, you know, he, I credit him a lot with helping me to stay motivated as well and, and pushing me and, you know, helping me uh, realize my dream. Damn, dope, dope. And when you got to the combine, how, how did how did that feel? Because I know like people don't realize, like in the NBA, like there's like seven billion people on this planet, right? Like right. there's less than a fraction. Well, there's maybe a few thousand that ever played in the NBA, right? And, and you're yeah. you're you're gunning for one of those spots because they're limited spots. It's not like anyone could just go on there. Uh, right. You're gunning for one of those spots. How does it feel to have that? Like, is there pressure? Because people are watching you. They're, they're making you jump. They're making seeing how much you could bench. Like, all of that. Uh, how, how does that feel, like, having to do that in front of people? At first, it was, you know, it was a nervous feeling. But then it was like, fuck it. This is what I, this is what I want. Yeah. This is what I work so hard for. So let me go ahead and give it my best shot. Let me show them what, you know, what to expect from me. Oh, yeah. Showing what I got. Were there know, any? I didn't uh, go drafted. You know, they didn't draft me. You know, Philly and Seattle were talking about drafting me. They kept calling. You know, I think we're going to get you with this pick. And then they picked somebody else. You know, and then at the end of the night, my name goes on call. You know, and I just got pissed off just thinking, all right, somebody's going to end up signing me. Yeah. And I'm going to make the rest of those teams pay for not drafting. Yeah, so let, let, let me go to draft night real, real quick. I know you said you, you went undrafted, but were you watching uh, and eagerly? Like, like yeah. h- how did it feel every time your name wasn't called by who you expected to call? And what was you, what were you anticipating going at? Like, what number? Well, Philly was – Philly. both Philly and Seattle had first-round draft picks. So, you know, and they had second-round picks. So I'm thinking I'm going to go in the first round. Okay. You know. Because I have performed well enough. Yeah, I have performed well enough at the pre-draft camps and everything. So, you know, I'm, I'm and I'm the, you know, the nation's lead shot blocker. I'm like, man, ain't no way in hell they're gonna pass up on me. You know, every time a name got called, I was just like, damn. All right, maybe the next pick. Maybe maybe the next pick. Yeah. You know, and then every, you know, damn, damn, damn. You know, for the whole night. You know, and uh, it pissed me off, man. I just felt like, all right, it's payback time, you know. Yeah, and it's crazy because a lot of people could have, like, just quit there. Like, ah, fuck it. Maybe it's not for me. I wasn't I wasn't picked. Maybe I'm not good enough. Or, or like, there's a lot of thoughts that can go through people's heads, right? And it's crazy that you're like, nah, fuck yeah. no. Like, like I, that, that, I know I'm good enough, right? So uh, right. What, 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 what set you up for the next step, like, like, like who, who helped guide you to this? Okay. This is what we have to do. You have to do this to get into the league. My agent, my agent, Sean Holly, he, um, he got me on the Lakers summer pro league team mm-hmm. down when they used to be at the pyramid at Long Beach state. Yeah. So I'm playing with Kobe, Derek Fisher, a lot of other great guys, you know, who were just coming out of college into the pros. And, uh, I was just killing, I was killing. You know, inside, outside, you know, doing my thing, ball handling, all that, just showing everything that yeah. I had. You know, as they say today, I went in my bag, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so one day, um, the coach of the Clippers at the time, Bill Fitch, was sitting, you know, at half court uh, with Elgin Baylor, who was the general manager. And uh, me and Kobe, we had just smacked somebody. Me and Kobe are walking off the court together towards the locker room. And the coach stops me and says, young man, if you're not signed by anybody at the end of the summer, you're going to be in an L.A. Clippers uniform. Oh, and I looked dope. at him. I was like, all right, thanks, coach. And as we're walking away, I elbow Kobe. And I'm like, yeah, right, fool. It's the Lakers. They don't know. Because <laughs> you know, I, I grew up a Lakers fan. Yeah. Favorite player, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, favorite number, 33. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, what I didn't know is that the Lakers, um, their roster was already set. You know, they already had all their players guaranteed, guaranteed contracts. So they didn't even have room for me. And Shaq was you know, on his way over there too, right? Yeah, Shaq had already played one year. Kobe had already played one year, you know. 
Yeah, it would have probably stunted your development anyway, because like you probably weren't gonna get too many minutes behind Shaq, being being brand new. So that that, that kind of worked out, you know what I mean? Nah, because then I'm I'd be able to play against those guys daily at practice. No, that's true. Yeah, you know what I mean. So they would have definitely kept me sharp, and you know I would have learned a few more tricks of the trade. You know, if I was in that situation. So, so let me ask, uh, uh, how, how was it like did, did, when you played with uh, Kobe in that summer league and, and Derek Fisher, did you know something was special about those guys? Because uh, they were really young at that point. A lot of people, yeah. Kobe had a lot of hype, but did, did you know like uh, uh, like he was a special player? See, I, I coached Kobe at an all-star, at an all-star camp when I was uh, the summer going into my sophomore year in college. Okay. He was still in high school. And all the college players, we were the coaches of the teams. You know, so I had Kobe, I had Jermaine O'Neal, Tim Thomas, another Man. cat by the name of Lester Earl, who was supposed to go, you know, from high school to the pros. And uh, we were smack teams by, you know, 30, 40, 50 points at this camp. You know what I mean? Yeah. And even back then, Kobe was that dude. You know, we knew he was special, you know. So it was, it was no surprise, you know, for me to see – what he was capable of doing, the way his career turned out. Yeah. You know, because I already knew, you know. Um, it's just that when he first got to the league, he was playing behind all stars. Yeah. So his situation was different from Michael Jordan or Kevin Garnett, where they didn't have any all stars at their position. They could just come in right away and, you know, do what they had to do. Yeah, because that was Eddie, Eddie and Jones wait. and Van Exel back then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cedric Sabalos. You know, so he had he had to look and learn, basically, you know, and he would kill those dudes in practice. Damn. They even, you know, we used to talk about it all the time, like, man, this dude is crazy. You should see some of the shit he does in practice, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But it was just a matter of time before he was able to, you know, get his time and and get his shine on the way that he did. So so let, let's uh, forward now to the uh, uh, end of the, the summer league. Right, so the end of the summer league happens. Are you feeling good about your chances of, of uh, joining the Laker roster? I was feeling good until I found out that the roster was full. Damn. Then it was, yeah, exactly. That's what it was like. Damn. And so I go to Utah, Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Yeah. I'm playing in their summer league with the Portland Trailblazers. So now I'm reunited with Jermaine O'Neal, who uh, was on the the all-star team that I coached with Kobe. Yeah. You know, so now I reunite with him. He's, he went the year before, you know, and uh, same year as Kobe. So we're just balling out, having a blast. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe I'll end up with the Portland Trailblazers, you know, and uh, Portland offered a minimum contract. Then the Denver Nuggets came on the scene. They offered a minimum contract and, uh, there was one more team, I can't remember who, uh, but another minimum contract. And uh, the Clippers came at the last moment, five years, 8.4 million. Damn. So exactly, exactly. And at the time, that was the highest paid contract for an undrafted rookie player. Yeah. You know, that was the same money as a number four pick. Damn. That year in the draft. Yeah. So that, that's said, crazy. Fuck it. If I if I can't if I can't play for the Lakers, I may as well try my best to beat them. Yeah. But I didn't know what kind of situation I was going into with the Clippers. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, you know, but before we get into that, it's 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 just a trip, man. Because you, they didn't let you play in your junior year in high school. You come mm-hmm. back and you mean you come back and you you fucking kill it on your 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 senior year, make it a college, right? And then right. you don't go, you kill it in your two college years. Things don't work out the last year though. Like uh, you, you, they told you it was. So you go, you become, uh, you get, make yourself eligible for the draft. You don't get drafted and you still end up making millions of dollars and, and ending up like in a, in a, in the NBA. Yeah. So you're beating the odds. What is it that's keeping you like pumped uh, about that? Cause I know uh, that's one thing I want a lot of people to know is that, that for the most part, if you got the talent and you got the heart, like you can do it, right? Like, what is right, it that, right. that kept you on that path? Like, 
I'm not quitting and I'm not taking that minimum money. Cause I knew that's where I belonged and I knew my worth, you know, Hell I yeah. knew what I was worth. So that just, it was like, I still got something to prove. So I was out there with a the chip on my shoulder. Hell yeah. Every, everybody out there was a target. I'm killing you. I'm killing you. I'm killing you. I'm killing you. You know, that was, that was my attitude with everybody that I played against. And uh, so this, uh, you, you sign with the, with the Clippers. Does your life change immediately? Hell yeah, because now I'm an A-lister. You know, I got access out of this world to the shit that I never knew even existed. Yeah. You know, and uh, I'm around all these fools that I grew up watching on TV now. You Damn. know what I'm saying? And, and yeah, exactly. Being invited to all these these high class parties and events, you know, that I never knew existed. You know, the lifestyle was was insane. It was insane. Had a lot of the, the, yeah, that, that's crazy. Because like, if you think about it, you're 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 a kid from Hoover. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. But it's like you put yourself in a situation where now you're Keith the boss class. You know what I mean? So that it's it's, it's fucking right. it's nuts the way the way. People can do that, you know. What I mean, it's like if you right. believe in yourself and you surround yourself around people that believe in you, you can you can do anything you want to do. Yeah. So, now the the jacked up part on my on me with me is I was trying to combine the the gang banging with the NBA lifestyle. Damn. So even though I'm a multi millionaire now, I'm still down in South Central chilling. Yeah. You know, and my vehicle's getting shot at and shot up on the way to practice, on the way to games, you know. I'm getting caught up in street shit. Damn. Because of who I am and where I'm from and the reputation of my neighborhood. We're, you know, even today, we're still the most hated. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It is crazy because the neighborhood Crips started recruiting all these different, you know, all these different sets under the neighborhood umbrella just to combat the Hoover. Yeah, because because we were smashing on everybody, you know, so Damn, their so. their existence today with the neighborhood car is only because of what what was going down with our neighborhood and you know and the others. Yeah, that's the trip. So did uh, did anybody try to tell you like, hey, hey, homie, like chill out, like like you're rich, dog, like protect protect your wealth or or was everybody just too young to understand, like, like really I had, what? I had a few. I had a few people that were, you know, trying to be encouraging. And look, like you said, you're a multimillionaire now. Yeah. You need to chill out. You know, you need to chill out, man. Now you're you're an even bigger target. You know, one because you're from Hoover, two because you made it. You know, yeah. I had. Couple OGs from different neighborhoods stopped me on occasion. Was like, "Look, little homie, you represent all of us, so you got to represent us the right way while you're up there. You know, otherwise we're gonna have to, you know, kidnap you, tie you up, and keep you in a closet to keep you out of trouble." <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, you know, I, I today I can appreciate that. Yeah, you know what I mean because I, I knew that what they're saying came from a, a good place. Yeah, you know, and um, oh, yeah. and some of those cats were from from our deadliest rival neighborhoods. Damn, you know what I'm saying. So to 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 be young with that kind of and faced with that kind of love, I didn't really know how to accept it. Yeah. And another part of me didn't want to accept it because I'm gonna do me at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, which is how these youngsters think today. Man, yeah. I'm gonna do me. Yeah, I hear you, OG, but I'm gonna do me. You know, and uh, I had I had to learn the hard way. Yeah, man. So most of us do it. It's like you could you could listen or you could learn. You know what I mean? Right. It's up to you. Like right. you go listen and do it yourself, and you figure it out. Like okay, I'm gonna just listen to what he said, or you could learn it the other way. Like either way, you're gonna learn. Right. Right. So so how how was it when you played your actual first NBA game? Man, it was exciting as hell. You know, uh, our first preseason game was against the Lakers in St. Louis. 
Damn. You know, so that was the first time seeing Shaq, you know, close up. Yeah. And I was like, damn, this a big motherfucker. You know, <laughs> I'm taller than him, but he outweighed me by a hundred pounds. Yeah. You know, and it's like, God, damn. And I just kept looking down there during warm ups. I'm like, well, fuck it, he got to guard me too. You know, I ended yeah. up with 15 that game, but it's preseason. It don't count for shit, you know? <laughs> yeah. But still, it let me know. All right, if I can go out here and I can score on this dude, then it's a wrap for everybody else. Yeah, and you know? I, I, don't, I don't think people understand how how big like Shaq was back then, like basketball wise. Like I remember fucking like I was like, man, Shaq could do everything. You know what I mean? Like, like that's the way right. I, I thought nobody could stop him. Like nobody could stop. Nobody Shaq. could. Nobody could stop him. All we man, the only thing we could do is just hope that he had an off game. Yeah, you know, because he's gonna he's gonna put you on a poster, you know. That's one thing that you can't avoid getting dunked on by him. You know, and I'm a shot blocker, so either I'm a block it, I'm a foul him, or he put me on a poster. Yeah, you know, and I and I've been put on quite a few posters by that dude. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that's what happens. Yeah, you know, that's part I, of the I game. Yeah, never, yeah, and I was just never one to back down. All right, you got me this time, but can you do it again? You know, and sometimes it, yeah, I can do it again, and he do it again, and sometimes I block it. Yeah. You know? But every time I blocked a shot by one of these big names, it was my my confidence was just you know raising and raising. Oh yeah. Like yeah, I, I definitely belong here, and plus the contract that I was given. Yeah. You know, I felt like. I should have been, you know, getting more playing time to prove why they're paying me that kind of money, you know, because you know, fans are like, wait, he's getting how much money? That boy yeah. only plays three minutes. He only plays three minutes a game. Why are they giving him all that money? You know, I wanted to prove to everybody why I was getting the money that I was getting, but my coach didn't believe in playing rookies, you know, and uh, it was just. It was just something that I had to try to adjust to. Damn. You know, that was a tough adjustment, man. Uh, because I, you know, pride and ego, when you're young like that, pride and ego is a motherfucker and that drives yeah. you, you know. So I would, uh, I would still try to do my thing anyways with the limited time that they were giving me. Yeah. You know? So the numbers never added up. Damn. The way that they could, if they had actually given me the playing time. You know, what's the trip is is the Clippers weren't even like doing great at that time, where where it's not like you're 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 taking away time from like a title contending team. You know what I mean? So right. It's like why not just let the the younger you mean the, the rookies develop? Well, management was fucked up. You know, if you were in a doghouse with management, yeah, they would come down. They would send somebody out of the out of the stands, you know, get in the coach's ear, pull you off the court. Damn. You know, so yeah, yeah, it was real like that. That was part of the politics of NBA basketball. Well, at least that was our experience with the LA Clippers. You know, Damn. so I mean, before then, basketball was always played with passion and just for the love of the game. Mm -hmm. But once you got all those millions of dollars involved. Now it becomes a business. Yeah. You know, and so now I'm learning the, the fucked up business side of, of basketball, the game that I love so much. Damn. You know, and it, it started to become like like a turn off in a way because there's all this bullshit that we gotta deal with behind the scenes that nobody know about. Yeah. You know, we got our owner, or he's a racist, you know, people found out years later, you know, well the public found out years later that he's a racist. But what they also didn't know is that he liked he liked men and he liked strong, muscular black men. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there, there's a and, famous uh, quote that, that he said that I always thought was kind of unusual for a man to say about another man if, if he's not if he wasn't gay. Not that I, I don't again, I don't have anything against homosexuality, but I just thought it was strange when when, right. when he said in the uh, newspaper I read. I guess he walks into the shower and says, "Look at those beautiful black bodies," or, or something along those lines. <laughs> And I was like, what the yo, fuck? Like, that, that's real strange. Like, what the, like, what the hell is about? Like, this guy is tripping. You know what I mean? Yo, look, check this out. After one game, 
Right? He used to come in the locker room after the games, right? Right as we were getting out of the showers, him mm-hmm. and his little cronies. And uh, he would send guys to go talk to certain players and shit. And uh, I used to have my nipples pierced back then. And so he came in after one game, and I don't have a towel on. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to show my junk for the, for the female reporters, you know, because that's what my mind had, trying to bag a reporter. Yeah. And uh, I'm just keeping it real, you know, young and immature. You feel me? Yeah. But, uh, he comes in, and I see him, and I, and I run back to the, to the showers and grab a towel. I grab two towels, you know, because I know it's get down. Yeah. You know, and because uh, he was always reckless eyeballing saying slick shit. So I come back out to my locker and he says, oh my God, I love those. And he started to reach up to my nipple ring and I karate chopped the shit out of his, uh, out of his wrist. I tried to break his shit. Like, yeah, get your fucking hands hey, out man. here. Yeah. I said, hey man, I don't care if you sign my fucking checks. Don't you ever try to touch me like that again. I'll yeah. break your fucking neck. You know? And he's sitting there. He's like, oh, oh my God, that hurt. That hurt. I'll break your fucking neck. You try to touch me like that again. And so I sit down at my locker and I start trying to get dressed with these two towels wrapped tightly around me. Yeah. So I'm struggling. I'm struggling to put on my fucking boxer briefs and shit. And he says, I hear his voice. Oh my God, look at this sweet piece of chocolate in front of me. Damn, that's so, trippy. Right. So I'm thinking, wait a minute. First of all, am I showing? You know, am I exposed? And then I'm like, wait, he said chocolate. I ain't chocolate. Yeah. So I look up at him and he's he's got his arms crossed so across his chest. He's still rubbing his wrist where I chopped him. And he's staring. And so I follow his eyes. And one of my teammates, Charles Jones, is bent over, putting on his, you know, trying to put on his underwear. And so he starts to sashay over to him. And I yell, CJ, look out. He's on you. He turned around and said, who's on me? I said, Donald. He said, what? He turns around and Sterling is real close to him. He flips over on his back. Hey, son, get the fuck away from me. He starts kicking at him and shit, right? <laughs> fuck away from me. Get the fuck away from me. What the fuck you doing, son? What the fuck you doing? I just grabbed my shit out the locker, ran into the trainer's room, the trainer's office, locked the door, got dressed, went out the back entrance, you know. But that's some of the... That's some of the shit that we had to deal with. Damn. That people didn't know about. And, and you know, people people don't talk about it because yeah. they're still trying to get, you know, because it's so political. Yeah. And they're still trying to keep their relationships with the NBA to where they get consideration for a scouting job or a video job or a coaching job, you know, so they keep their mouths shut. Yeah, I was asking. I was asking a few NBA execs about them during uh during the All Star weekend of 2000 when it was up in the Bay Area. Yeah, and uh, they said that they had all kinds of recordings of him from back in the 80s. Damn, the crazy shit that he used to say, and they were just waiting for him to flip the script on them so that they could expose them. Yeah, you know, so people always had shit on them, but as long as he didn't cross the line with them. He was safe, you know. It wasn't until this one broad exposes him, then everybody's in an uproar, like, "Oh my God, this is," you know. Yeah, you know, it's 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 crazy, man. You know what, what makes that situation even more like troubling is the fact that you guys don't have like an HR department where you can go run up to and complain because that's the owner of the team, right? Well, but- you can, but. You know, who wants to report sexual harassment as a man? Yeah. You know? Damn. So that, that's, said, a, that's just a, a tough position to be in. Damn. And, and how long did you end up staying uh, staying with the Clippers? Three years. Then Three I got years. Suspended my, yeah. And then I got suspended my fourth year on some, on some bullshit, some black ball type shit. Damn. You know, um, yeah, it was fucked up, man. You know, told me not to come to training camp. I'm there at at uh, media day, and so we just got Elton Brand, we just got Quentin Richardson, uh, Keon Dooling, and uh, Darius Miles. And so we're greeting them, chopping it up with them. And the year before Everybody's, was 
was like your highest Every- your highest numbers too, right? Yeah, yeah. So we're all excited, man, because these guys are talented. We know we're talented. So we're thinking, all right, we're going to do something, you know, this year. And we got a new coach, Alvin Gentry. Yeah. So everybody, everybody's just, you know, reviving, you know. And uh, Elder Baylor comes over to me and tells me not to go to training camp. He says, we'll call you. I'm like, damn. All right. So a reporter comes over to me. I'm sitting there with Jeff McGinnis and a couple guys. He says, uh, Keith, Elgin Baylor says that you're a head case. Do you have anything to say? And puts the microphone on my face. And I said, uh, wow, it's unfortunate, you know, that he feels that way. But I think my, my teammates would be able to tell you otherwise. So I'm just focused on coming in, having a great year, trying to help my organization win. Yeah. You know, I told him, have a good day. And, uh, Everybody was tripping like, damn, why, why, why would he do something like that? Yeah. You know? And then, so I don't go to training camp. I'm waiting for them to call me and tell me what's up. But in the meantime, I go ahead. My agent gets me a trainer. I'm going and I'm working out twice a day, six days a week. I'm doing everything with this trainer that I would have to do with the Clippers. Yeah. So I take a physical from an outside source the same way that I had to do with the Clippers. I pass. High numbers pass. The next day, I do the same shit with the Clippers trainer, and he fails me. So that happened three times. So the third time, I asked myself, why do you keep failing me? I just did this yesterday and passed it. Yeah. What's going on? He said, oh, well, that's between your agent and the organization. I can't say anything. Damn. So I knew right then that they were trying to fuck me over. You know? Yeah. So I got a call one day. You know, yeah, we heard uh, there's some teams that are interested in you and uh, they want to give you some good money and we don't feel like you earned it or that you deserve it. So we're going to suspend you and tell the media that you're out of shape. You know, oh, I was out to dinner. I was out to dinner with my girl at the time. And, um, uh, I just threw up right there on the spot. And, you know, I just switched to a, from that point, I switched to a, a liquid diet. You know, all I did was drink. Wake up in the morning, drink. Damn. You know, for lunch, drink. For dinner, drink. You know what I mean? And uh, cause I, now I'm out of millions of dollars. I'm suspended for the year. So that's 2.1 million that I'm not going to get, you know. And it just had me in a real bad space. You know what I'm saying? And uh, then I find out later that they put out that I was smoking crack. And that that's why I was so skinny and couldn't gain weight. You know, yeah. when the fact is my metabolism's always been high. Yeah. I've never been able to gain weight. I would get toned up. You know, I would get stronger, but I wouldn't get bigger. You know? Yeah. Built, built like a matchstick, just like my dad, you know, so. But, yeah, I ended up getting black ball from the NBA. Damn. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And so I just took it back to the street. Yeah. I'm just in the hood all the time, you know, chilling, getting in the shit. And fuck them. That's a, that's a trip because, uh, uh, because you're – because you – you're with the Clippers, you're still in LA. So it's not like you yeah. went and you built, like you planted roots anywhere else. You know what I mean? It's like you you basically were right there, like you said, in the hood. So that's what you went back to, what you were familiar with. Uh, it's damn. So so you're, you're drinking, you're drinking now. And, uh, you know, you, they took away your dream. They took away mm-hmm. your, your money, uh, part of your money. Uh, what's the next step? What, are you, what are, you, what are you thinking? So now I go over to Italy and uh, I'm playing in Naples, Italy. I only last year two months because I'm, I'm smoking weed now. And I fell, a, I fell a drug test because of the weed. They yeah. gave me my money, send me home. You know, I was supposed to fly home on 9 11, you know, but I got drunk the night before, missed my flight, turned on the TV. I see all the build, you know, the buildings, the Twin Towers coming down and shit. I'm, I'm thinking that's a diehard movie that Bruce Willis made. 
Yeah. You know, until I realized it's on every channel. Hold, hold on one second. Yeah. Gotta love the kids. <laughs> but yeah, I got stranded in Italy for um, for a week. Damn. Because it was not a you know the World Trade Center attacks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, um after that, I joined the Harlem Globetrotters for a while, but I'm still drinking heavy, you know, on tour with them and everything. I got I got sick on tour down in Mexico and uh and it's they ended up sending me home. You know, because they, they thought I was going to die on them. Damn. Damn. And what's crazy is the, the Globetrotters, like, that's, it seems like a fun gig. Did you ever have the chance to appreciate how fun it could be, like, doing all those tricks and doing all the crazy, like, like, you got like, Man, crazy athleticism? Or I you... sucked at the trick. I still can't <laughs> spin a fucking ball. You know, we, we have, we do weekly Zoom meetings, me and my Globetrotter teammates. Yeah. And, you know, I still talk shit to him about that. I should sue you motherfuckers. I still don't know how to spin the ball on my finger. You know, but they were teaching me how to do, you know, certain certain tricks and whatnot. Yeah. And certain combinations. You know, the, the crazy thing, man, is people think that that's all that they're about. But they got some guys that can actually play. Yeah. You know, at least at least when I was with them in two thousand two, they had guys that could that could just flat out ball. I was with them late 2011, I mean 2001. Yeah, because after I got sent home um, from Italy, that's when I joined the Globetrotters, like a week later. Yeah. And two months, and then two months later, we went on a tour of Ground Zero, you know, with the Globetrotters. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. But those guys had some serious talent, some serious skills. They could really play. You know, a lot of people didn't know that they had two teams. They had the show team with all the tricks, and then they had the competitive team that did a college tour, you know, playing against the universities. Where oh, it was no. just straight up basketball. Yeah, it was just straight up basketball. So the, during the show, they'll incorporate real basketball along with the tricks. They'll just split it up during the quarters. The first half of the quarter will be, you know, doing tricks, and then the second half of the quarter will be straight basketball. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's that's crazy. I, I I didn't know that either. I just thought it was just like uh, uh like you said, just the, just the tricks. I didn't know they had the, but I knew they could ball because you have yeah. even people I seen in uh, uh the D League that I know they could fucking ball. It's just sometimes it's circumstances. You know what I mean? Right, right. So um um, how how long do you stay with the uh with the Globetrotters? I stayed with them six months. Six months. Six and months where, before I got sick. And what is happening next? Um, after that, I go to uh, the CB, no, the USBL, United States Basketball League. Yeah, I'm playing for a team called the Pennsylvania Valley Dogs, and uh, Daryl Dawkins. I used to play with the Sixers and the Nets back in the day. He was our coach, so yeah. you know, got guys who are again highly skilled. That was the second best league outside. Of, that was the best league outside of the NBA. Yeah, you know, because you got all these talented dudes playing. You know, Kareem Reed out of Arkansas. He was a point guard at Arkansas. He's from you know the Bronx, New York. He's a Bronx of Harlem, on one one or the other. He's from New York. You know, street ball legend out there. Um, Tim Wynn, who put another guy who played the same Bonaventure, little point guard who was real tough. Quincy Wiley from Temple. Um, who else? Terrence Roberson, who played at Michigan and then transferred to uh, Fresno State. Tunji Awujobi, who was at, who was a beast at Boston University. Ace Custis, who was a beast at Virginia Tech. You know, we, yeah. we had dudes. We had dudes that could play. Olden Polonese came and played with us one year. Out of you know, while he was trying to earn his way back into the NBA. You know, I was fortunate enough to win. A championship with them, a USBL championship. Oh, don't. At all. That league was full of talent. Matter of fact, you heard of Roy Jones playing basketball, right? The boxer. Yeah. Well, 
he was he owned the team in that league and played for it. Oh, shit. Down in Florida. Yeah, so we're playing against Roy Jones Jr. Randy Moss, the football player, he played a couple games with us. It was, it was funny, just, you know, down on the block and then throwing a lob over my shoulder to Larry, you know, Randy Moss for a dunk. <laughs> you know, we, we had a good time with it. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, how long did you stay there? I played with them for three years. Three years. What what ended up happening where you had a or where you ended up leaving? I um went over to China, played out in China, then uh went over to Germany. Was trying to get on in Germany, didn't work out. Um, and after that, I was just back and forth to China. You know, play a little bit in the ABA, play a little bit in the CBA. You know, CBA was another great another great league with a lot of talent, you know, guys that should have been in the NBA. And, you know, some guys were getting called up to the NBA. Some guys weren't. Yeah. And that was all before the, the G League. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's crazy because you had a, um, oh, I forgot his name, uh, uh, Mar Marbury, Stephen Marbury, yeah. who was killing it out there. Yeah, like, man. He was, that's a god in China. You know, they got the Marbury Museum. You know, they got a statue of him. Damn. They did the Marbury movie. They did a Marbury play on his life. You know, he he's a man out there. He's got Chinese citizenship. Oh, yeah? You know, yeah, yeah. He's got citizenship. He only comes back to the States to visit. And then he's he's over there full, full time, you know, just integrated into society. You know, they love him and he loves them back. That's, That's crazy. Cool. That's one of the things that I appreciate the most about playing internationally is, yeah. you know, the, the love is insane as a, as a, as a player, you know, with the, with the fans of those countries or cities, you know, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the, like, people don't realize, like, uh, I think, you know, he realized earlier on, early on that there's a market too. Like, it's not like people, oh, absolutely. Yeah, that they get too focused on like, just the bright lights over here, not understanding that there are bright lights other places and there are other cultures, like you said, that will, will take, they love basketball. So it's, it might right. be a little unfamiliar, um, but it's that love is still the same and the passion is still the same. Yeah. Yeah, so, man, it is. And guys, a lot of, one thing that a lot of these youngsters don't realize is that we all have dreams of making it to the NBA, but that dream isn't always going to be a reality. Some yeah. people... They get so discouraged that they just stop. They give up. Yeah, you know they don't. They don't fight to you know to continue playing. But they can make it overseas somewhere, have a, a long, you know, successful playing career. They could be just as big as Kobe, Durant, yeah. LeBron, Jordan, in another country. Chris Gent. When I was in Italy, I played against Chris Gent. He was with the Warriors for like a year or two. Yeah, and. Um, he got released. He, he got released. And uh, so I'm playing against him at his home arena during the announcements when the team is running through the tunnel onto the court. They announce his name and the whole arena, 20,000 people, break out into a song just about this dude. <laughs> That's just crazy. about this dude, 20,000 people, yeah. you know, singing about this one cat who averaged, you know, 1.3 points a game in the NBA. But yeah. over there, he was killing and became a fan favorite instantly. So now he's on the same status as the NBA guys here in America. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because you could you can have like a, uh, you could be a good player out here, but if you're not like a superstar, they won't know you overseas. And I mean, right. it's like, but overseas, you could have that same guy who's in the NBA <laughs> be next to an overseas superstar and they're going to recognize him more. You know what I mean? They're going to be like, right. like he's in the NBA. Yeah. But this guy, I seen him play. Yeah. That's, that's, that's crazy. So oh, um, yeah. did you eventually try to make your way back into the NBA? Yeah. Um, 2007, I end up, I get sober. Uh, Coach John Lucas, you know, bless his heart, man. Uh, I'm in Houston. My agents sent me down to Houston, Patrick Kelly, Rest in peace, and uh, 
Jerome Anderson, rest in peace. Two amazing guys that believed in me and helped me get on this path of sobriety. They sent me down to, to Houston. Yo. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, so let me rewind a little bit. Um, how do you, how do you get to the point where you realize like you need to cut down on on, on the drinking? Because one day, I one day the thought comes to my mind: Why did everything go from sugar to shit? Yeah, you know the main thing that kept coming back was my alcoholism. You know, most of the time when things were going bad for me, I had been drinking put myself in these different, you know, bad positions. And so I decided, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore, you know, and I was sincere about that. And uh, I decided that I was going to keep smoking weed because they were just now starting to legalize it. And, you know, was when they started giving out the marijuana cards and all that. So I'm like, cool, I can just do that instead. Yeah. But I get down to Houston with Lucas and, um, you know, he starts talking to me about it and, uh, yeah, man, you just need to just leave it all alone because the, the league is testing for it now. And, you know, they have been since you've left, and uh, you don't need it, you know. I ended up getting sick the last few years of my drinking, you know, yeah. real bad for a week at a time. And, uh, you know, hot, cold sweats, um, hyperventilation, temporary blindness, can't, I'm vomiting too, it's nothing but bile coming up. You said, you said temporary you know, blindness? Yeah, yeah. How, how does that yeah. feel? Oh man, can't see nothing. Damn, can't see nothing. Yeah, yeah, man. So it happened once when I was down in Houston with Coach Lucas, and um, he thought of you know he thought I started drinking again, but come to find out, it's pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis triggered by greasy food. Damn. So he takes me to. A sober living that was run by another former, you know, basketball player who played for the Denver Nuggets of the ABA back okay. in the day before they switched to NBA. Yeah. Before they merged, and um, uh, you know, uh, I couldn't even fill out the the paperwork, the admission paperwork, because I'm just so messed up. And they put me in a first phase house, which is right behind the office, you know, and all the houses that are part of this program are in the community. Yeah. You know, just looks like a regular house, you know, and um, except there's like eight guys living in it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But uh, an hour later, you know, it starts to hit real bad and I can't breathe, you know, and now the temporary blindness is coming back again and I'm crawling towards the door, Damn. you know, because I feel the breeze from the door. So I'm crawling towards the door, gasping for air. And I start taking off my clothes because I feel like they're just too tight on me. All I got on is a t-shirt and some shorts, but it was just constricting. That's the way it felt. I couldn't breathe. So I'm taking that stuff off as I'm crawling towards the door. And, uh, you know, the last thing I see is a pair of ashy black feet and some sandals. You know, someone yells out, call 911. Damn. I said, I'm... I said I knew I knew I knew God was black. <laughs> and and uh the next thing I know, man, two days later, I come to on life support in the hospital. Oh shit. So that trips me out. You know, I, I sit up and I'm just pulling stuff off of me and out of me. Yeah. You know, and uh, the machines go off and they run in thinking that I had died, you know, and I'm sitting up on the bed. You know, yeah. and uh, the doctors are tripping off of that. And then they explained to me that I almost died in the emergency room when I got in, you know, two nights before. Damn. So, you know, I, I just break down emotionally right there, you know, because I've been holding all that shit in for years, yeah. you know. And uh, the doctor, he was like, don't you play basketball? I said, yeah. He says, what are you doing smoking weed? There's all kind of weed in your system. I said, don't they test for that? I said, yeah. He said, well, cut that shit out. You know? Yeah. I'm just sitting there crying because he just told me that I almost died two days, you know, two days ago. Yeah. I can't remember any of it. 
All I know yeah. is that I'm plugged up to this shit. You know, I get on the phone, call my mother. You know, I find out that my mom was notified about things and she had planned on, you know, she had was making arrangements to come down there, you know, to be with me. And uh, she got there the day that I was released. Damn. So I get back to that sober living. I was in the hospital for five days. So I get back to that sober living and then she arrives like, she lands like an hour later, you know. Yeah. And uh, I've been on this, this path of sobriety and recovery ever since. So Damn. it's, you know, it was a life saving and life changing experience for, you know. And so today my life is about helping other people, you know, that have alcohol problems, drug problems, you know, mentoring yeah. young basketball players, mentoring kids, you know, just trying to help people avoid the same, you know, self destructive path that, you know, I have been on. Oh, yeah. And this question is, is, Man, just to say, like, uh, I, I want to see how bad the, like, how much of an impact, a negative impact the drinking had on you. But by the time you sobered up, how much of that, uh, well, it was originally $8 million. We said they, they suspended you, so $6 million contract. How much of that did you have left? Oh, that was, that was gone by 2005. Damn. Because, you know, yeah, that was gone by 2005 because I was still drinking heavily. And, you know, just making a lot of reckless decisions. And, you know, I hated to see other people going without. And so I was I was taking care of a lot of people in the city as well. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and drinking away and giving it away. I had a record label, you know, uh, back then. And, you know, which turned out to be a bad investment. And, you know, tricked off money with that. And, uh child support, 9,000 a month, Damn. you know? So, but the biggest thing was the the bad decisions that I was making yeah. based on my alcoholism and, you know, my failure to to take sound advice from anybody. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm grown, what are you gonna tell me? Yeah. You know, and just being, just being young and ignorant. Yeah, that, that's, that's the reason I brought it up because I, I, I wanted people to see like, when you drink, like people might think, I got this under control. I got this under control. Right. A lot of the times, like if you're drinking every day, you probably don't got that under control. You know what I mean? And it's Absolutely. like, yeah, you, you'll see like little by little things will happen until you're like, shit, how'd I lose everything? It's right. Like, you set that shit up before years ago. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And didn't even see it. But I'm thinking, yeah. you know what? I'm going to play in the NBA for 20 years like Kareem did. I'm going to get another contract with another team. I'm going to get away from this situation and I'll be straight, you know? Yeah. But I, I set myself up for failure. Didn't even see it. Damn. You know? man. Didn't even see it. So yeah. I didn't get smart about what I was doing with my money. You know, had a, had a nice big home, you know, in Claremont with my family there. And, you know, a neighbor of mine is Nate Dog, who lives around the corner. Oh, dope. You know, rest in peace, too. Yeah, and but still, thinking that somebody's going to call, that phone's going to ring, somebody's going to offer me a big contract, I'll be back in the NBA where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, you know, and it was just something that never, that never happened. Damn, because the damage was done. And again, somebody said that I was smoking crack. Damn. So, that really just pushed everybody away from me, you know. And so, so how, how are things uh, nowadays? I know you said you, you your your goal is to help as many people as you can. What what are you up to these days? Well, I'm in Texas now, you know, right outside of Dallas. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I got here, I was back in California, you know, running my own youth basketball program, Claw Stars Elite, you know, out of uh, San Bernardino. Uh, it's just, you know, I, when I got back from China two years ago, cause I was coaching youth basketball in China for, for a minute. Yeah. And, uh, when I left that job and came back, you know, I saw that there are a bunch of these so-called coaches and trainers out here that, you know, were coaching these teams running these programs, these AAU programs and travel ball programs, but. They weren't teaching the players anything. They weren't teaching the kids actually how to play the game. 
you know, yeah. a lot of times what they were doing was they were holding tryouts and just selecting the best players and throwing them out there and letting them do whatever. Damn. You know? And the kids just, they lack basic fundamentals, Yeah. you know, of basketball. And I said, all right, that's got to change. You know, let me go ahead and, and do my part and giving back to the kids that way as well, teaching them the right way to play basketball as well as, you know, sprinkling them with with some life experiences and you know along the way yeah. just to help them continue to develop into good young you know good young people oh, that's dope oh yeah yeah because there there's a lot of people will even say that and it might sound crazy to people but i've heard charles barkley say it a lot where the kid got uh natural gifts but he don't know how to play basketball and a lot of right. people don't, don't right. understand what that means you know, he's like, what do you mean? Yeah. He's dunking, he's doing this. It's like, yeah, but it's like, like, if you take away that athleticism, and I think a, a like a, a great example of this is, is Kobe. He's always been very athletic, but when he slowed down a little bit, his game changed, right? Because yeah. he knew how to play basketball. And that's what people don't understand. Right. It's like, you take away somebody's athleticism, they're not going to be the same player. Are they going to still know how to play without it? And that's crazy. Right. Like, you have to, You have to know how to do that. So that's a good yeah, thing because right? you're setting them up for that. If where they don't have to just rely on natural abilities, they can rely on of what's up here and knowing the game. Yeah, yeah. basketball is ninety nine point nine percent mental, you know, and that that point one percent is, you know, what you do with it on the court. Yeah. So guys think that their athleticism alone is gonna, you know, make it work for them. And for a lot of guys, it does mm-hmm. because they got certain teammates that can that can compensate for, you know, their deficiencies, where they're deficient at, you know. I'm, with me, man, I'm real fundamental heavy with the players that I coach and train. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're, they're sitting there, they're looking at NBA basketball and just looking at bad examples of what to do. They're looking at bad habits yeah. real early, you know. And uh, I'm just trying to help change that narrative so that by the time they get to high school, by the time they get to college, they're fundamentally sound and the coach doesn't have to worry. That's just one less thing that the coach has to worry about. You know, now they can get out there and, and, and play and be productive for their, for their respective teams. Oh, yeah. And, and I know that there's a, there, are, there are a lot of options now for, for basketball. Like I said, there's overseas, you have the NBA. But one that I really like, and hopefully it comes back soon after the pandemic, is uh, the big three. Is there yeah, any yeah. chance that, that we'll see you in the big three or, or trying out or, or any part of that? I was going to try out for it this year, oh, man. but, you know, yeah, the pandemic went ahead and just smacked all that, you know, yeah. out of the box. So maybe, maybe next year. What, what do you think about the uh, the big three? At first, you know, I'm not a fan of three on three basketball, mm-hmm. but um, never have been. But once I start watching it more, you know, I just really started to enjoy it more because you can see the growth again of these yeah. retired players, you know, knowing when to turn it on, when to coast, you know, and then playing smart basketball and yeah. having fun with it, playing smart competitive basketball. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's the thing I enjoy because I enjoy watching. Uh, ever since I I heard it, I was like, oh hell yeah, like that sounds like a interesting idea. And yeah. when they put it together, I'm just like, they made it a real show. Like it's a show. Like it's yeah. like. Uh, uh, you use like it's not too overdrawn it's not drawn out or it's like unnecessary it's like you play up to a certain amount of points and then you see these guys that still got game balling yeah. that shit up and it's like hell yeah like i really enjoy that yeah me and my wife took um we took my my little basketball team to the big three championship game oh dope. you know yeah yeah and after the game i was able to take them to the back by the locker rooms they got a chance to be Ice T, take a picture with, I mean, Ice Cube, take a picture with him, you know, Snoop, taking pictures with him, and uh, and Big Debo, you know, rest in oh, peace. Rest in peace, yeah. You know, he was one of my old next door neighbors in the marina when I was playing for the Clippers. Damn. So, you know, being able to see him again, and then, you know, my wife got a picture with him. She's like, oh my God, I can't believe you know him. I'm like, yeah, this is my dude, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But it feels good to be able to introduce people to situations that they normally wouldn't be able to experience 
You know what I mean? Let them go ahead and have some fun. And and we had a lot of fun. And while we're watching the games, I'm questioning my players, even though it's three on three, I'm questioning them about what they're recognizing, you know, that the players are doing on the court. Yeah. Why did this guy have an open shot? Why did, why was this guy able to make that pass? You know, uh, why did this guy get a steal? But, you know, and just trying to elevate their basketball IQ. Oh, yeah. You know, and, uh, man, they had a great time. Everybody, we all had a great time. Oh, yeah. So, lo- like, looking back now, right? Like, let's say if you, uh, when you were a kid, right? You're just a, a young youngster back in your days of being, being back in Hoover, right? You had dreams of going to the, M- of the NBA. Uh, looking back as a kid, did you ever dream that you would see everything that you've seen today as, as a grown man? Nah, nope. It was shit. First of all, I never thought I'd live to see a black president and we got Barack Obama. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? So, but my generation, man, you know, I'm 44, I'll be 45 in April. You know, my generation, we were told that we wouldn't make it to, to the age of 18. Yeah. You know, and so many of us didn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm blessed and fortunate enough to still be here. God saw fit to, to save my sorry ass you know, for a bigger purpose that I never imagined would be my life today. You know, world traveler, you know, lived internationally and uh, been able to teach the, the game that I love to thousands of kids along the oh, way. Yeah. You know, played at the highest level and uh, I get to live two lifetimes in one. Damn, you know, a lifetime where I'm, where I'm drunk, fucked up, game banging, doing all this crazy shit to being sober and being a productive member of society, being a teacher, you know, to all these kids, you know, a mentor, fatherhood, to, you know, being a husband even, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, it, it's a trip, man. Oh, yeah. Trip. I, never, I never imagined my life to be what it is today. So I'm just extremely grateful yeah and i think i i I don't think people understand like how fulfilling that is and how much like like you said all those things you mentioned you can't put a price tag on it those those are like they have so much value in them and it's like because i always tell people like i don't if i die without a penny in my pocket right but my kids Mm. say he was a good dad and my wife says he was a good husband i succeeded in life right like like, that's you know what yeah. Now that I'm sober, man, ever since I got sober, like dudes were from different neighborhoods. Now they know that I'm sober and I'm not with that bullshit anymore. They started contacting me, reaching out to me. Yo, look, I got a I got a relative over here that's, you know, doing bad with the drinking or with the drugs. You think you could help? You know, they live over here in the hood. Look, let me know what day you can come through. You good. Yeah. So now I walk anywhere a free man, you know, whether it's a blood neighborhood, you know, the rival crib neighborhood. I'm not worried about it because I walk a different walk today. Yeah. You know, I'm not out there set tripping on anybody. I just show love to everybody. You know, the way that I was always meant to do it, the way that everybody's supposed to supposed to be with each other. Yeah. You know, I finally get to I, I finally get to live that. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so I, I, anytime somebody calls me to, to help a loved one, anywhere I can be of service to somebody or to a situation, I'm there. Because oh, yeah. this blessing that I, that I get to live today, I want everybody to know what this shit feels like. You know? Yeah. A Clippers fan. A Clippers fan, dude, hit me up uh, the other day, last week. You know, he hit me up on Facebook. Hey, man, I'm going into rehab. You know, the drinking's gotten out of control. He was talking to me a little bit about it on Facebook um, over the last couple of years. But, you know, he sent me a message. Yo, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it this time. And, and thank you for, you know, thank you for the encouragement, you know. And, uh, and I appreciate shit like that, being yeah. able to help people. That's what I appreciate, man. And that 
that right there is the most priceless thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Just being able to have a positive impact on somebody's life based on the way that you're living yours. Yeah. What's crazy. A lot of times you won't even realize it at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're just doing what you do, trying to help people, but you don't know who you're helping, who, who, who's, who would slip, who's slipping through the, through the fingers. Like, and then when they yeah. tell you, like, how does that feel when they tell you, like, I changed and thank you. You, you had a, you had a big part of that. It's very humbling. You know, I try to be as humble as I can today, Yeah. but hearing shit like that, it, just when you think you can't get any more humble than you are, you know, God puts you in another position to where you're, you're humble much more than that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's, man, it's amazing. Dope, dope. And uh, what, what does the future look like for, for keep the boss class? Hopefully I'll be taking my basketball program overseas. I'll be taking my teams overseas to play in tournaments against, you know, other, uh, other companies, other organizations trying to help these kids develop, you know, international relationships at an early age, getting them out of the bubble, away from their neighborhoods, you know, that way they can not only establish international relationships, but it'll encourage them to stay on top of things academically, yeah. you know, most importantly, and, uh, I want to show them what this world is really about, what it, how big it is, and what it really has to offer everybody. And basketball is a vessel for that. Yeah, that's a great thing, man, because a lot of people don't realize what's outside of their block, what's outside of their right. city. And when right. you take them to a whole nother place, you're going to take them out of their comfort zone. But if you do that in a way where you put, <sighs> like, doing it for, they're going to be safe and like, playing basketball is a way they're going to stay safe and they're going to be able to see things that they never even knew. Like you said, they didn't even know existed. They, and right, it's right. going to open their eyes. Like, wow, the world is like way bigger than I thought it was. And that's some dope shit. Yeah, man. man. Hell yeah. Because I want them to be able to touch the places that they see in, you know, in books. Yeah. You know, cause that's the first time I walked on a great wall of China, man, it was a trip. You know, I've been there five times and every time, I go, it's still just as amazing as the first time I went. And I want those kids to have that same feeling. The first time I walked on a castle in a castle in Italy, you know what I mean? Yeah. I want kids to have that same experience. You know, I saw this in the book, but now I'm here. You know, I get to smell the smell. I get to eat the food. I get to be in, in that community, the environment, you know, experiencing the culture. Yes. Oh man, dope. And be before we wrap it up, is there anything else you wanted to say? Um, you know what? Anybody that's discouraged about stuff, you know, always look at it, you know, always look at the glass half full. You know, for young athletes, young student athletes, your grades come before anything. You know, uh, the 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 long money that lasts is the money, you know, it's in those books. It's contained in those school books. You know, it's nothing to become an overnight millionaire playing a professional sport, but that money can be gone in the blink of an eye. You know, you got to have the education behind it that'll teach you how to maintain that money, not only maintain it, but to learn how to make more money, yeah. you know, so that you're able to take care of generations once you're gone, your yeah. kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, but now you've created generational wealth through some company, some business that you've developed. You know, uh, and for the ones who put too much pressure on themselves, stop trying to be perfect. You know, there's no such thing as a perfect athlete played against Michael Jordan and Kobe, you know, who are some of the greatest of all time. And they were far from perfect, you know. So I teach my players to just worry about progress. Yeah. Yo, I try to teach my kids about progress. You know, it's all about being the best that you can be, you know, That's every sad. day I think about how I could be better today than I was yesterday. And I look for ways to do that. I also look for ways to put a smile on somebody's face, you know, look for a good deed that I can do for somebody because not only will it feel good for them, but it'll feel good for me as well. I'm making a positive impact in somebody's life today. Yeah. 
Yeah, and people like I want people to understand too. Like, if you never try to do that, try it because when you, you make people, when you help somebody out and you make somebody happier, it's so much more fulfilling and so much. It, right. It's way better than just winning on your own. I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's hard man. to explain, but uh, it's way better when you help somebody and they're like, even if you don't get anything out of it, fuck, don't don't worry about getting anything out of it. Like, if you help somebody and they're like. Hell yeah, I did it. Thank you. I appreciate it. That, that shit feels so cool, man. Yeah. And you know what, man? Our life experiences, they're not ours. They're for the next person that's coming up behind us. You know, we get to use those as a tool to teach them and to uplift them. And that, that's what life is about, man. Yes, it's sir. about uplifting the next, you know, your fellow man, your fellow woman. It's about being of maximum service. You know, it's not about tearing each other down. It's not about killing each other. It's not about stealing from each other. It's all about loving each other and taking care of each other. Yes, sir. That's what life is about. Man, well, I appreciate you being here, Keith, man. I, I, with, uh, those are some great words to, to live by. And I, I encourage everybody to explore those words and, and, and you know, put them in a, in a, put them in a way that in your life where, where you can utilize them. But I appreciate you taking the time to chop it up with us today, man. Hey, it was an honor and a privilege, man. Shout out to my boy, Wicked Willie, too. Shout out to Wicked Willie. That's the boy right there. And uh, Yeah, man. My little brother right there. My little brother from another mother. Yes, sir. And with that, we out. Peace. All right. Peace.